Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me all right. I think we're still expecting a few more people to join in, um, but I will, given it's 1230, get started. So my name is Deanna Huggett. I am currently the Director of Strategic Initiatives at Neurological Health Charities Canada. On behalf of NHCC, I would like to thank you for joining us this afternoon. And today we welcome Dr. Christina Wilson to provide an overview of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. Um, participating in today's webinar are representatives from various member organizations of NHCC, some of Dr. Wilson's colleagues, and uh, there may also be, we may also be joined by a representative from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, I would like to just thank Dr. Wolfson for agreeing to do this presentation for NHCC um, and to provide a little introduction to Dr. Wolfson. Dr. Christina Wolfson completed an undergraduate degree in mathematics, a master's degree in mathematical statistics, and also received a PhD in epidemiology and biostatistics from McGill University. She's a professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. Um, excuse me, she's a, a professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics and Occupational Health and also in the Department of Medicine at McGill University, where she's also an associate member in the Departments of Neurology and Neurosurgery and the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. She's the program director for the NMS National Education and Training Program. And Dr. Wolfson is uh, also a fellow of the American College of Epidemiology. And her program of research lies in population-based research in neurodegenerative disorders, including multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, and epilepsy. Dr. Wolfson is co-principal investigator on a five-country study of environmental risk factors in multiple sclerosis that was recently completed in Italy Norway, Serbia, Sweden, and Canada. Uh, and Dr. Wilson is also co-principal investigator on the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. So the CLSA is a 20-year uh, study of 50,000 participants aged 45 to 85, and Dr. Wilson will provide more um, information about the details of the study in her presentation. Dr. Wilson leads the CLSA's Neurological Conditions Initiative, as well as the Veterans Health Initiative. The CLSA Neurological Conditions Initiative was one of the projects of the National Population Health Study of Neurological Conditions. And it is this initiative that Dr. Wilson's presentation um, will primarily focus on today just to provide you some information um, about, uh, about sort of the areas of, of most interest to the NHCC. Um, so I would uh, now like to turn things over to Dr. Wilson. Um, Dr. Wilson, if you'd like to go ahead, I will turn my microphone off now. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. Um, first thing I want to say is I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be able to give this webinar. I guess the second thing I want to say is I've never given a webinar before. Um, I'm feeling a little lonely sitting here in my office with just my laptop to look at. Uh, much more used to being in a room and being able to make eye contact. So um, hopefully we'll be able to somehow send vibes over the internet and, and that can be the substitute for, for eye contact. Uh, what I wanted to talk about uh, today is the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging as already described. In fact, what I'm going to do is give a little bit of background um, about the study, uh, a little bit uh, about what it is that the study is doing, the data that are being collected. Um, I'll talk about the availability of the data uh, for the community who wishes to do analyses, and then I'm going to talk uh, again briefly about the future. Um, I'm not actually going to concentrate so much on the components of um, the project that I worked on, the NHCC project, uh, but perhaps to give you a broader overview so you can see the study as a platform, clearly a platform for neurological diseases, but also a platform uh, for other aspects. Um, and yes, of course, there's this little chat box, and I'm going to, I think someone's going to be looking at it for me in case any of you have any burning questions throughout, uh, but certainly I'm, I'm available uh, at the end. So uh, you'll see on the lead slide, uh, there are three 
co-principal investigators, uh, myself, Premier Arena, and then Master University, and Susan Kirkland at, at Dalhousie. We've been together at, as a triumvirate uh, since the outset of the planning of this project, which I think says a lot for uh, our personalities uh, to a certain extent. Uh, but certainly the, the team is much, much larger than this, but I, I'm just giving this on behalf of the three of us. Okay, so I have to click here, right? All right, so as already mentioned, 50,000 participants across Canada. This is a study of aging, not a study of the aged exclusively. So we have um, gone down in our age range to age 45, picking up the baby boomers, uh, to age 85 at baseline, following all uh, for 20 years, um, if we possibly can, and even more if we can get funding, uh, to look at uh, all aspects of aging, and as you noted, even in the younger age group. So there are more than 160 uh, investigators involved in this in, in, in about 26 institutions across Canada. We're looking at um, very many aspects of aging, biological aging. We look at genetics. We look at psychological aging, uh, social aging. We're looking at economics, how things change over time, nutrition, health services, uh, and of course, population health. So there's a lot to look at in aging. It's not just a biological uh, phenomenon. So we try to, we're try to we trying to capture that in the CLSA, which is why it's so large. Um, the, the study itself was a, a strategic initiative of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. It was Rejoin Baer, uh, who was the first director of the Institute of Aging, uh, whose vision it was uh, to have a longitudinal study of aging in Canada. He, he put that um, challenge out to the research community, and um, Susan Perminder and myself, uh, accompanied by our colleagues, responded to that challenge, and, and here we are today. The, so the funding comes, the primary source of funding for the operations of this study are from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. We also have major funding for Canada Foundation for Innovation, which has allowed us to build standardized infrastructure across the country to be able to conduct the study. And of course, uh, funding from the provinces and the universities across Canada as, as partners uh, in the CFI. And there are other sources of funding, but the major components uh, come from the CIHR and the CFI. All right. So just to talk about the investment to date, so it's, it's $50 million plus uh, to implement uh, the study, to recruit, to, to design, to develop, to implement, to recruit, and to do baseline assessments on all these participants. Uh, the funding that we received from the CIHR was $23.5 million for the first five years uh, of the study, and that's ending actually this year. That, in fact, was only 86% uh, of the funding that was required to conduct the study. Uh, so the expectation is that the research team uh, actually identify non-CIHR partners uh, to make up the difference that, that is needed in order to implement the study. So the CFI money, it's a total of $26.5 million, uh, but $10 million, for those of you who are familiar with the CFI, $10 million comes from the CFI, $10 million is matching from the provinces, and $6.5 million comes from the so just some of the key uh, team members, that little photo of us, I'm on the right, uh, Parminder is in the middle, and Susan Kirkland is on, uh, on the left. Uh, we have key team members uh, across the country at a number of universities, at University of Victoria, at UBC, SFU, Calgary, Manitoba, McMaster, Ottawa, McGill, Sherbrooke, Dalhousie, Memorial, and Waterloo. Those are just the key members. Those are the people we communicate with at least uh, once a month, uh, but the team is much larger. We have scientific working groups who have helped us in the early stages put the materials together and who are now working very closely with us uh, to make some changes, some tweaks uh, for the follow-up to improve things, to add new material. And we have a website, I've just listed that uh, there for, for anybody who wants a little bit more uh, information. So what's the vision? Um, the vision is that this not only is a study, but it's also a platform. Uh, providing also infrastructure to enable state-of-the-art interdisciplinary research and evidence-based decision-making. Um, it, it's a platform in the sense of the physical infrastructure that we have built, which is uh, available to other researchers to use in our downtime, uh, which these days are, are not very many, but in our downtime. And it's also a platform in terms of the data uh, that 
are being and have been collected. So the research platform is really at the core of what uh, the CLSA is, although it is, and I think it's important to emphasize this, the study was designed by researchers to answer scientific questions. Uh, at the end of the day, though, it is a research platform. So what's the aim? Uh, we were very clear uh, from the outset that we needed a study that would take into account the dynamic processes uh, of aging on all uh, d in all domains, all axes, and also looking at interrelationships. And again, looking from midlife uh, to end of life. So not starting at the artificial uh, age of 65, which has some define uh, as aging. So these are just some examples. There are many, many to choose from. Obviously, we are in a situation where we can identify the presence of health conditions. We don't have um, assessments by clinicians in our study because it's too big, uh, but we do have mechanisms to identify health conditions, and this is, of course, relevant to the neurological uh, aspect. We also, uh, over the longer term, will certainly be able to look at risk factors uh, for health conditions and also factors that influence the course of diseases. And we're looking at you know, the aging cardiovascular system, the renal system. We're looking also at diabetes, the musculoskeletal issues, mental health issues, obviously cancer, respiratory, vision, and hearing, all of those things that, that we're looking at. And we can look at them either as predictors or as outcomes or as intermediaries. So with the scope of data we're collecting, uh, there's also a, a huge scope uh, of research to be, that can be done using these data. So here's the, the busy slide, which gives you an overview. And I think if I understand this, I can get a little arrow to do something here. Uh, can I? Hmm. Am I? Am I? Can you see an arrow? Anybody see an arrow there? No. Not yet, Dr. Wilson. Just a quick question: Are injuries yes. included also in? Uh, yes. Yes, yes, for sure. No, I, I can't get it to work. But anyway, okay, so here's a study overview. So as we've said a few times, 50,000 men and women aged 45 to 85 at baseline. Um, we've divided the level of data collection into two levels. Uh, we have one level, so on the left uh, of the slide, you'll see we have 20,000 people randomly selected within uh, the 10 provinces, from each, each of the 10 provinces. And follow that down, you'll see that those are the individuals who are only uh, examined by telephone. They're only assessed by telephone through a telephone-administered questionnaire. So clearly, that, to a certain extent, limits the depth of information we can collect on these individuals. But it was important to have a nationally representative sample covering all provinces. If you have a phone, you can be called in any part of any province. So it was important that uh, we have that. So these we call these people the tracking cohort. So if you have a, a piece of paper and a pencil, just write that down. Tracking cohort are the telephone, uh, people who are, have a telephone interview. So that's T for tracking, T for telephone. These individuals are following that, that left-hand column down are followed up every three years with the same, uh, same length of interview, so about a 60-minute telephone interview. And then in between these two major waves, we make a briefer contact with them, which we call the maintaining contact questionnaire, because obviously we want to limit the number of people we lose that are lost to follow up, that have moved, uh, and we can't find them, and also just to kind of see how, how things are going. So we have these major waves of data collection every three years and this maintaining contact in the middle. Um, from time to time, we will also be uh, linking with the health administrative databases. All participants are asked uh, for their health insurance number. But they do not have to provide it, but if they do, they then get consent for us to go ahead and request linkage, uh, provincially based uh, linkage. So that's the tracking cohort, which there's a lot of very interesting information coming from, from that group, but very little, of course, no physical assessment. If we move over to the right-hand side, we have the remaining 30,000 people. Now, these 30,000 people are what we call the comprehensive uh, cohort. And think of comprehensive, C for coming in, C for comprehensive. So T for tracking telephone, C for they come in, comprehensive. 
So these people are randomly selected within 25 to 50 kilometers of 11 data collection sites that we've built. It's not feasible to have a completely random sample of individuals across Canada who would then have to come in and have an assessment. The geography just doesn't work. So we uh, identified the sites, we built the sites, um, renovated the sites with our CSI funding, created these data collection sites, and then we went ahead and, and recruited the participants to come to these sites. Their participation comes in in, in two components. They first have an in-home face-to-face uh, interview with an interviewer. So we send someone out to their home to be interviewed. It's about a 60, 70 minute interview. There, the overlap uh, between that interview and the telephone interview is, is significant. It's almost 100%. We do a couple of extra things because we're in home. For instance, we ask them to show us their medications, which you obviously can't do on the phone. After they've completed that interview, they then are invited uh, to come to one of these data collection sites. Uh, and at the data collection site, they undergo two and a half to three hours of assessment. So we do some clinical, some physical testing. Um, if they agree, they uh, provide a blood, blood sample and a, and a urine sample. And again, just with the tra just as with the tracking cohort, we do this all over again every three years and follow them up in between with a brief telephone interview. And we also do data linkage. So at the end of the day, we're going to have 50,000 participants at every wave who will have completed an almost identical questionnaire. And 30,000 of them will have had much more in-depth measures. So it's quite a, a, a large uh, undertaking, as you can imagine. So it's national in scope. I thought it was important uh, to just let you know uh, how this lays out geographically. The little blue dots are just meant to represent the telephone interviews. They don't actually represent the number of people, but the fact is that they all are uh, across uh, the country. The red dots represent uh, the data collection sites. And so we have data collection sites, as you'll see, uh, across the country, all the way from St. John's uh, to Victoria. There are a couple of provinces where we don't have. Um, I had to learn my geography for this one. So Saskatchewan and New Brunswick, uh, we don't have uh, a data collection site. Uh, it was really, uh, when we started, it was really because there were not at that time, and we're talking you know, more than a decade ago, researchers uh, who had the ability to pull this together uh, as part of the CFI. So that's what uh, the, the scope is. Uh, just some more process slides. This is uh, the data collection in this study is paperless. So everything is electronic. Uh, we do send letters to the participants, so that's obviously paper. But after that, uh, everything is done electronically. We do have backup paper copies of everything, obviously, in case there's an internet uh, problem. Uh, but all information is recorded from the participant and automatically sent uh, to the secure server. So hopefully that reduces uh, some of the potential data entry errors. So participants are sent um, the study information. Uh, they are then, well, potential participants are sent the study information. They are contacted and asked to consent to participate. Those who consent uh, then provide uh, questionnaire data. And if you look at the right hand of this slide, they either provide it through a telephone interview, their telephone from one of our four computer-assisted computer telephone interview sites, or they provide it through the in-home interview, that those who've done, who have done the in-home interview then go to the data collection site visit. Uh, they provide the blood and, and urine. Their data are uh, stored at the statistical analysis center. The biological samples, the urine and the uh, blood samples are stored at the, what we call the BBC, the Biorepository and Bioanalysis Center in Hamilton, which was built uh, with the Canada Foundation for Innovation uh, Fund. So we built the infrastructure that is needed for the study. We built the data collection sites, the telephone interview sites, the statistical analysis center, and the biorepository. So just to tell you what happens at the data collection site, because this is the part that people are sort of interested in knowing what happens to someone who comes. I'll take you through this quickly, just following the arrows. 
people come in at reception, they sign in, and that doesn't mean they actually physically sign, uh, but they come in, they're, they're scanned, they do a contraindications questionnaire so we know what kind of tests we shouldn't be doing on them if there's a contraindication. You know, if they have a hear, an ear infection, we need to know that maybe we shouldn't be doing the hearing test on them, for example. They then go into a measurement room where they, we take a lot of measures, the height, weight, uh, blood pressure, uh, we do spirometry, we do a carotid ultrasound and an ECG. They move, then move to another room where we do a DEXA, uh, a DEXA scan on them, full body DEXA scan. They then move to room number three uh, where we do vision testing. We actually take a photograph of the fundus, we do ocular pressure. We also in that room do grip strength and uh, the first set of neuropsychological testing. They then come out into our hallway which is also built as a data collection site. They do the timed up and go, uh, they do a four meter walk, a timed four meter walk, and then they do a balance test. They then go into the fourth measurement room where they have their hearing tests. They complete something called a chronic diseases uh, questionnaire, and then they do additional neuropsych testing. They then provide their urine sample. They move into another room for the blood draw. Uh, and we, it's not listed, yes, here it is. Then they check out, we give them a little snack after they've had their blood draw. They get some, um, some, a minimal set of results from the test that they've had, so they get their spirometry results and their vision and hearing, et cetera. And then we give them $30 for their time. So this is about a two and a half to three hour assessment. Uh, and all of this, as I said, is electronic. Dr. Wolf, so we've got two just yes. quick questions here. One is the, uh, wondering if you might speak to the security of the data that's collected. Okay. So the, the, Okay, I can do that. So the data uh, that are collected through the com computer assisted telephone interview sites, again, automatically go to a uh, very secure server, data server, and obviously you know, we, we keep separately any of the contact information from the data itself. Uh, the data that are sent for, uh, sent to the Statistical Analysis Center have already had all of the contact information removed, so they're already anonymized. I mean, we have a, a very, very secure uh, process for the data because there's, you know, it's absolutely uh, clear that we cannot be having any of this data um, seen by anybody, anybody identify who our patients, uh, who patients, who our participants are. So, you know, we have a, a very strong um, IT team at the National Coordinating Center in Hamilton who have been charged with the responsibility of designing the system for that. So that, you know, for us, security is, is number one for sure. I don't know if that answers the question. I, 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 I'm not an IT expert to go into the physical detail as to how that is done, but because we don't have any paper and so we don't have piles of paper being copied and couriered and faxed. Uh, we we actually are at an advantage when it comes to security. Thank and of, of, cor of course, all our staff sign confidentiality uh, agreements. Thank you. Looks like the question was addressed. And there's just one more question. Uh, wondering if you might briefly touch on uh, the difference between the CLSA and the CSHA, which was conducted in the 1990s. Oh, yes. Of course, I, I can answer that question right away. The Canadian study of health and aging, and I apologize for the, the, the two names being very, very similar, was a study of dementia. Uh, I was actually a, a, a contact principal investigator on that study as well. The study itself was set up with the primary objective of estimating the prevalence of dementia in Canada. The way the study was conducted is it was a cross-sectional study where 10,000 individuals were recruited and the data collected were focused on the identification of dementia, so the neuropsychological testing. There was a clinical assessment. Um, so the idea was to come up with the, the diagnosis of dementia. There are all, obviously a lot of people who did not have dementia. A second uh, wave of data collection was then planned five years later to follow up the people who were not demented at time one, as well as those people who were. So it was not set out to be a longitudinal study, and it was absolutely focused on dementia. So the energy in identifying health conditions was on identifying dementia. So it was, it was a very classical, very important study, very classical disease-based study. 
which is the CLSA is not that. We're much broader than that. So I have several slides here, and I'm looking at the time, and I'm thinking I won't go through uh, all of this long list of things that are measured. Hopefully you'll have access to these slides so you can take a look. I've mentioned some uh, of these. So of course we take physical and cognitive measures, measures in our um, comprehensive uh, cohort. Uh, these, this is a list of neuropsychological tests uh, that we're doing at least at baseline. We have a, a number of other things that, that we've included, uh, looking at some of the social aspects. How, and Obviously, we're interested in how these things uh, may change over time. So social participation, for instance, satisfaction with life. Uh, we have quite a, a, an important component of our questionnaires, both for all 50,000, on work to retirement transitions, planning for retirement, you know, how many times have you retired, that kind of thing. Uh, we also have um, a at the baseline, we had a veteran identifier set of questions, so where people self-reported that they were veterans. We included that post-traumatic stress disorder screen as well. Um, mobility questions, built environment. Uh, lots of questions, lots of health information, but remember in the absence of, there are no physician assessments uh, in this study. So in the absence of that, you know, we're collecting health information through self-report, but also, also through some of the measures and then through the data linkage. So we asked a lot about chronic disease and symptoms. Medication is important, of course. Uh, oral health, we're expanding that component in the follow-up. Uh, general health injuries is, is mentioned. Pain and discomfort, functional assessment, activities of daily living, et cetera. So I, I do want to get to some other things, so I don't want to spend too much time. The classical lifestyle and demographics, obviously smoking, alcohol consumption, physical activity. And, and you know, those kinds of things are going to be repeated over time. And clearly, ethnicity uh, is not going to be repeated, and marital status will be, education, income, transportation, home ownership. So we're, we're asking a lot uh, of our participants. So now let me tell you where we are, because I think that that's important to know. This is how we got there, this is where we are. So remember the tracking uh, cohort, the telephone interviews. So the recruitment and baseline data collection are now complete for those 20,000. And the data are now available uh, for re release to researchers. So researchers uh, who want to use this, students or researchers who want to use this, can now make application to get access to these data without any of the identifying information. Uh, we've also started these these um, short brief interviews that I mentioned that take place in between major waves and so far have uh, completed over 13,000 uh, of those. And what the good news for us is that 96% of the people are continuing. So the losses have not been uh, very, very much at all, which is very good news for us. We're not finished yet. We still have to uh, continue with these maintaining contact uh, interviews, uh, but I think so far we're doing very well. And we're going to begin, for this group, we will begin the first full follow-up this summer. So it took us you know, two, three years to recruit all these participants. Those data are cleaned, ready for release, and now we're going to start going back to them uh, this summer. For the comprehensive co cohort, we started a little bit later because we had to build the site. So it's ongoing. And so far, um, we've recruited about 27,000 of the 30,000. So we're really on track. This, is, this means we've got them in for at least the in-home interview, which is the first component. Uh, so we're very much on track to finish this later uh, this spring. All of these data have to be cleaned and prepared, so we won't be ready to release these data until 2016. We've started the maintaining contact, this mid-wave uh, brief questionnaire already, and we're close to 6,000 uh, with that. And that's also doing very well with a high response rate. And we will be starting the first full follow-up uh, for these folks also this summer. So I mentioned this before, and it's very important to, to emphasize this, is that the data and the biospecimens are available to the community. And speaking a little bit about the, the security and confidentiality, you know, we have some fundamental tenants associated with our release of these data and biospecimens. It's clear, uh, and we have a very formal process that the rights, privacy, and the consent of the participants 
must be protected and respected at all times. So indeed, when we review applications, we assure that what is being applied for the project actually fits in with the consent that the participants gave at baseline. Because we can't know everything that people will apply for. So, so our data and sample access committee makes sure that what's being done fits in with what the participants agree to. And of course, the confidentiality and security of the released data and the biospecimens have to be safeguarded. So we have an access uh, process. Uh, we have set up a web page on our CLSA website called Data Preview. The process that we have is, is um, it, it's, it's quite formal. Uh, we try to make it streamlined so that it's not a barrier, but we have an administrative review. Our committee uh, reviews the application, makes a recommendation to the scientific management team. Following approval, there is a formal sharing agreement that is signed by the institution of the user and by McMaster, who are the custodians of the data, we verify the ethics approvals, and we provide the raw data um, and or the biospecimens, whichever is the case, to the approved investigator. Uh, so this is not a situation where someone is only getting summary data or has to go to a location to access it. The raw data are provided uh, to the researchers. This is just a screenshot of our data preview portal, which we tried to make very simple by just having three buttons, overview data sets and access. Uh, I will talk briefly, because I want there to be time for questions, to just let you know what's happening at the follow-up. So we're going to start the follow-up, as I said, this summer for the tracking. So we're going to be recontacting. It turned out that we over, uh, we had more than 20,000 participants uh, by, by the time we shut our data set. So we'll be recontacting all of those for their follow-up telephone interview. We're going to be starting the follow-up uh, of the comprehensive at the same time, recontacting 30,000 par participants to begin the process of starting the in-home interview. And then we're going to be starting actually the second maintaining contact questionnaire uh, in, in 2016. Some new content has been proposed. Um, it's obviously great to repeat the content just in terms of looking at trajectories, but new issues arise, new interests arise, new measures are available. Uh, we look back at what we collected and realized there were things that we left out. So these are some items that we're adding um, for all 50,000 at this point. We're adding a, a, a module on child maltreatment, maltreatment of the individual when they were a child. We're adding uh, elder abuse. Um, epilepsy was already part uh, of part of the study, but it wasn't part of all 50,000, so we're making it now part of all 50,000. We're adding additional hearing. Uh, measures, um, additional measures of arterial stiffness. Obviously, we have to develop, um, given the nature of this study, a uh, decedent questionnaire. So we're looking to, you know, how do we contact the proxy? What is it that we ask about the individual who had passed away who was a participant? We're adding things on workability, subjective cognitive decline. We're ramping up uh, on the materials we were collecting on transportation. We're adding preventive uh, health behaviors and some more information on health care use. And so this is all currently in development, fine tuning how we're going to ask these questions, how we're going to take these measures. Uh, we have to accommodate um, for the changing circumstances of the study of aging. So by its very nature, the people are going to get older uh, in the study. So we know they're going to move. So we have to sort out what we're going to do if people move to try and maintain them in the study. Some people will become institutionalized. We do not want to lose people who enter institutions because that's losing valuable information. Uh, there will be people who will have mobility challenges. They may not be able to come to one of our sites. So we're actually uh, developing a mini data collection site to use in the home. You know, what kind of measures can we have the interviewer use at home to collect that? We will, may have to make special considerations at our data collection sites for individuals, for instance, if they're in a wheelchair or they're using a walker, et cetera. Uh, there could be increasing sensory challenges, so uh, particularly hearing, because we are contacting these folks first by telephone. So we're, we're working a little bit on how we're going to maximize being able to communicate with someone uh, who has uh, some major uh, hearing impairment. 
Obviously, cognitive challenges are put at the bottom of the list, but it's obviously not at the bottom of the list. And so we're working very hard to perhaps identify who might be at risk of having cognitive deterioration from looking at our neuropsychological testing at baseline. So we're obviously developing protocols for the use of proxies and what kind of assessments we would be able to do on people who have varying levels of cognitive impairment. So there's lots, lots to change, which I think um, highlights that there is, you know, this is a dynamic study that is going to have to adapt to the circumstances not only of the participants but also uh, the science. Uh, we, we have fortunately been able to uh, obtain some funding from CIHR to actually do some analyses of our baseline biomarkers that we collected because one of the things I didn't say at the beginning, and I should have, is that the funding provided uh, for the operation of this study does not include any funding for analyses of the data. It's purely for operating the study and collecting the data. So any funding to analyze the data has to come from somewhere else. But we were able to, to get some funding. Our, our international um, oversight committee, like an international scientific advisory board, recommended that some funding should be put in to do some evaluation of some of the baseline uh, biospecimens we collected that could become part of the CLSA database for researchers. It was considered to be a, a very good investment. So we're very pleased about that. Uh, I just pulled out a couple of things that may be of interest to this group and might uh, might actually um, set aside a question or two. Collaborations with other initiatives. Throughout the development of the study, we have spent a lot of time and resources in collaborating with other initiatives, either through things as simple as the PIs having a face-to-face -face meeting to discuss common uh, issues, common questionnaires. Uh, how things are done, how they share data, et cetera, to more uh, in-depth collaborations. And one example that has come on the, the, um, the map relatively recently is the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging. Um, we actually have quite a close collaboration with that group. Uh, they are interested in using our infrastructure, particularly our biobank. And uh, obviously, they're going to need access to the data because they're looking for nor a normative comparison for their studies. We've also, we're also looking at harmonization of the measures and perhaps adding measures to the CLSA to be in line with what CCNA does. And what we've done, and we did this um, last year actually, was to form a CLSA CCNA liaison committee so that these collaborations were not ad hoc. It's actually done quite formally. We have a committee made up of um, researchers and the PIs of both initiatives and we meet probably once every six weeks to discuss the ongoing issues. CCNA is trying to get in the field. We have things we can share with them. Uh, also, we're putting in a proposal to CIHR shortly to develop uh, a brain imaging sub-study because that's one thing that's missing in the CLSA is imaging. Uh, we're not going to propose to do it on all 30,000 people. Uh, but we're proposing uh, to do it on a, on a subset of participants. And again, going to CIHR through the normal competitions for funding to be able to try that out. So we have lots of partners, and I apologize this list is, is probably uh, old, and we should have more. So certainly the Public Health Agency of Canada through the Neurological Conditions Initiative for sure, and also uh, through a collaboration looking at injuries. Uh, we had a collaboration uh, at baseline with Veterans Affairs uh, who funded the inclusion of the Veterans Affairs questions, the Veterans uh, Identifier questions. We have had a very strong collaboration in the development of the study with Statistics Canada uh, through their methodological input and a, a source of part of our sample, Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, the provinces, universities, uh, et cetera. So I think uh, in the interest of allowing questions, and I suspect there are many, uh, I thought I would just stop there and I guess at this point open it up for clarification uh, or questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson. Uh, it's Deanna Huggett. I'm just um, wondering if you, before we kind of the questions start rolling in, if you might touch a little bit more specifically on uh, the uh, neurological initiative and, and sort of more specifically on what was included and why. Okay. Okay. So the, the plan for the, uh, 
the neurolog neurological conditions initiative, and this of course started after the CLSA was already in the field, was to take a, a very close look at what was being collected and to determine what needed to be adapted to, to be able to realistically identify individuals with neurological conditions. And, and so we just selected a few because we know even with a sample of the size which seems large, there are a lot of conditions that would be uh, you know, woefully uh, underrepresented. So we did that. Um, and um, we really highlighted, we know we're going to be looking at dementia. I mean, that's a given. We've already set up um, neuropsychological testing. Uh, we're actually validating an algorithm using those tests. It's currently on, ongoing. It's not yet uh, finished. And we identified Parkinson's disease as a very important component in this uh, cohort. So what we did is um, we did have a self-report question for Parkinson's disease and the tracking, but that's obviously not enough. So we identified a screening tool based on, probably some of you would be familiar, the Tanner uh, tool that basically asked about symptoms. And we implemented uh, that in the comprehensive cohort. But then at the same time, because we're dealing with different uh, timelines, at the same time, we actually uh, formally validated the use of that tool within our sample. And the way we did that is I had a uh, neurologist who was actually a master student of mine. And we recruited from the CLSA, I think it was about 200 CLSA participants who completed the questionnaires and then had a neurological assessment by a neurologist. So if you like, the gold standard. Uh, and we were able to then validate uh, the, the use of this tool in this group. So even though we implemented it, you know, we had great faith that it would work, we then went on to validate it. And, and the analyses of those data, uh, the complete data, are still underway. But in fact, it is now implemented. Uh, this this tool is implemented in both uh, the tracking and in the comprehensive for the next wave, which I think is really, uh, really good, much better than a self-report. For epilepsy, um, we did the same thing. Uh, we did have uh, self-reports, which again wasn't felt to be adequate. So we identified a screening tool for epilepsy, and we validated it again uh, in the, uh, the CLSA, and it is now uh, going to be implemented in both the tracking and the comprehensive. So those were the very tangible uh, things uh, that we did. The other, the other, um, the other thing that we are currently doing is we have had a, a request for the data approved. Remember, these data only became available for use in the middle of last year. We submitted an application to access these data. That application has been approved, and we're just waiting for the access agreement to be signed, and then those data will, will be analyzed. Uh, one of the things we found uh, along the way by just sort of dipping into uh, the data to have a brief look is that, in fact, there were more than uh, 300 people within the sample who self-identified with multiple sclerosis. I, I actually wasn't expecting uh, that many, uh, so that suggests to me that we may wish to perhaps uh, look a little deeper uh, at that subsample in, in future studies. So, so what we've done is we've, you know, we've, we've brought the neurological conditions to the forefront of the study. We have something called the Neurological Conditions Initiative, which I lead, uh, which is at the moment largely uh, validating tools that we are including in either in the baseline or in the future waves, and also analyzing the data with these, uh, with aspects of neurological conditions in mind. I don't know if that answers. That's great. Can I thank you, Dr. Wilson. Uh, next question: What are the types of preventive health behaviors that you'll be integrating into the study? So, so if this question is asking what the questions will be, then obviously we're, you know, we're asking about the standard things like Pap smears and changes. You know, have you changed your diet? Have you tried to lose weight? Do you have flu shots? Those kinds of things, that's what I meant by uh, preventive health behaviors. We're just asking questions. We don't intervene uh, in this group, so we're just asking questions. Thank you. Are there um, 
is there an opportunity for, to address other uh, neurological conditions within the CLSA? You just identified that you may be looking a little bit further into MS and just wondering about the possibility for others. Yeah. Well, certainly stroke. Uh, I think we have, we, you know, we have to deal with the numbers. Uh, it's 50,000, as I said, sounds like a lot. Uh, but for certain conditions, it just won't be enough. So stroke is, is on the agenda. Uh, we do have, uh, you know, obviously we have self-report questions. We do do some physical assessments uh, that could be related to, you know, cardiovascular risk factors, et cetera. So that's there. Um, you know, you know I, I would love to be able to look at, at ALS. I think that that's just not in the cards. I think for Parkinson's disease, we can move to also look at Parkinsonism. I mean, we can do that as well. Um, I am very keen, and this is just my own personal interest, I'm very keen to introduce um, some testing of olfactory function uh, in the CLSA. I'm looking into ways to be able to fund that so that we could have a marker for that could be correlated with future outcomes to see whether changes in the olfactory function I think we know are sometimes associated with uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So it's a, basically a scratch and sniff test. Can we implement such a test in the CLSA? But again, it requires funding uh, to be able to do that. But I'm open to other conditions if anybody's interested um, to see if we have the numbers to support that those kinds process, of analysis. Is that about, uh, say, a, a health charity contacting you directly, or what type of a process would that entail? Well, basically what's happening now is people just generally contact one of the principal investigators, and generally when it has to be, when it's to do with neurology, people contact me and say, you know, the typical thing would be, are you looking at this? And if my answer is no, not yet, then the next question is, is there any way we could think of looking at it? And then we take it from there. Uh, because obviously we want this platform to have the biggest bang for the buck. And if we can add uh, new material that are absolutely of interest uh, in terms of learning more about the condition or the risk factors or the prognostic factors, then it's seriously considered for, for inclusion. But everything, unfortunately, does come with a cost. It's a cost of additional measures for the participants, additional time, um, and, and you know, that, so that's always uh, a consideration. So we do have to prioritize what goes in. If there is a, uh, if there's an ambassador or a cheerleader for a particular area, certainly within uh, the PI, <laughs> then that, that usually works a little bit better. So if anybody's interested here, please contact me and I'd be happy to discuss what's, what you know, what's available in the CLSA and what's possible for the future. That's great. Um, wondering also if you have, again, recognizing that there's always a, a cost, but if there are, is a vision or a plan or any proposals in place for um, bringing the age range um, further down from 45? Not not in the context of this study. Uh, we you know we started the cohort in this age range. If we brought in another cohort now from a scientific perspective, that would be you know they would have started at a different point in time. Uh, so yeah, it would be great uh, to bring it down. But this study, uh, you know, I don't think uh, this this particular study in, in its current focus is going to come down. It would have to be a companion study that would perhaps take the same measures and start with a younger group. So going to 45 was already something that people weren't doing at the time that we Along that same line, Dr. Wolfson, are you, um, there's a Partnership for Tomorrow Project, which is another sort of national uh, cohort study, I believe. Um, I may not have all my details right there, but just wondering if there's any linkage or any, is there a liaison group with the, the Partnership for Tomorrow Project as well? Well, we don't have a liaison group, but that was a group that were um, already in existence when we were in our planning stages, and we had, you know, we had some formal meetings. We I had a, a conversation with one of the PIs actually not so long ago who was asking me, you know, how do you release your data? Should we do it the same way? Uh, we've looked at the measures that they're using relative to the measures that we're using. Their focus is on cancer, 
so their measurements are more related to, you know, risk factors for cancer, which is quite understandable, less so, uh, for instance, on cognition. Uh, so you know, we, we're sort of more general aging, but yes, we, we, we have had many meetings uh, with these groups to see how we can maximize, you know, what we can do together, what we can learn from one another, but their focus really is uh, on cancer. Um, so how are you working with the Ontario Health Study? Um, I think we, we, we're we not uh, working directly with them. Uh, I think that there's been quite a bit of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, quite a bit of change in the leadership in the Ontario Health Study. I know that we have had some discussion about possibly sharing a, a physical uh, data collection site with them. So we're in, we're in discussion with them, we know them, uh, but I, there's no formal collaboration as long as, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and I know that, that our national, um, our executive uh, manager is, is on the call, and so she may know from it, Master Ina. Uh, oh, yes, okay, so Ina just sends the answer, correct. We are discussing sharing some of our infrastructure, infrastructure space, because we don't, we actually currently don't have uh, a site in Toronto, so that's been the discussion. Okay, I'm just going to put the final call out for questions here. Um, as we're waiting to see if anything final comes in, uh, Dr. Wilson, I, I really want to thank you for your time in putting this presentation together and, and uh, the opportunity to have the discussions with you. Um, I think there's a lot of interest and excitement about the CLSA and, and what's sort of coming forward from it. So um, congratulations on the work you're doing. It's, uh, it's, it's really exciting. Um, I do see, thank you. I do see a question here. What percentage of the cohort has been found to have entered the study with any disorders or diseases? Okay, so I, we have actually haven't done that analysis. You mean, you know, what percentage of people have any kind of a, of a disease? We haven't looked at that. It's relatively easy to do uh, that. Uh, if associated with our organizational focus, yeah, okay. Um, one of the things I can do, and even you could do it, in our data preview web page, we actually have a, a variable search mechanism. So you can go in there and type in the variable that you're interested in. For instance, if you're interested in Parkinson's disease, you can type in Parkinson's and you will then get uh, the data. It will say what percentage of people answered yes to that question. Uh, it's probably something I should do since I know what the questions are, but for all of the partner organizations that are part of the NHCC, I could actually go in and see if anybody had uh, self-reported any each of these conditions. And then, of course, I could see, you know, how many people have reported one, at least one of these conditions. I'd be happy to do that uh, for this group. Probably that easier would be to fantastic. Thank have you, you do it individually. Okay, so, oh, I see another question. Have participants overall been open to having their data linked with other data sources? Yes, well over 95% of participants have agreed to that. That's not, that hasn't been done yet. We're working very carefully with the provincial data stewards to see how we can do that in each province and then, of course, nationally in some standardized uh, method. But yes, they've been very open. Uh, that's all part of the consent. We give them information package and yes, they by and large agreed to that. Is there, recognizing the, the value and utility of the work that you're doing, is there, do you have any um, suggestions or um, way for the health charity organizations to sort of help support the work you're doing in terms of advocacy? Are there um, things that we could do to sort of help support your work? And certainly one of the things that HCC has done has um, highlighted in our pre-budget submission to the Government of Canada, the work that you're doing and some rec um, recommendations for digital yeah. funding, um, but do you have any other suggestions? Yeah. Well, I, I think, in a way, I think the onus falls upon uh, the research community to analyze these data and then, you know, and, and in collaboration with NHCT to come to you and say, okay, now we have some uh, results, we have some uh, information on the prevalence of this or, you know, how it varies from province to province. Now we need your help in getting this information out there. So I think actually, I mean, I, I probably shouldn't be saying this on this call, but I think the onus is on, uh, the, the researchers to produce some information because I think it's very hard for 
to help charities to say this is what you need to do without knowing what the numbers are like. And I think that was one of the earlier questions. If we can get a better sense of the numbers and, you know, if I had, if I had total access to the data myself, which I don't because I have to make a formal request, I you know, would have liked to present some of that material today. But I'm sort of encouraged now to, to, push, to push forward with the access that I do have. Because I think that's what we need to do is to provide, uh, and not just the NHCC, but other health charities perhaps with a bit of a summary for the conditions that they're particularly advocating for of, of magnitude from our study and, uh, you know, what other research could be done. So I think from terms of advocacy, I think you need results first. So we're just about uh, at 1.30 here, so maybe I will just um, uh, close again by saying thank you, Dr. Wolfson, and, and perhaps uh, you and I can um, connect offline. I'll provide you a list of the um, conditions that uh, of our member organizations and, and really appreciate the offer for you to, to run that initial um, sure. screen yeah. um, and then I will uh, we will work to send that information out to our member yeah. organizations and also provide them uh, the link to the, the recording of this um, webinar which I believe you said will be posted on your website um, so really appreciate your time and uh, look forward to connecting further in the future with you Thank you.